Hello and welcome to uh, this uh, new webinar organized and co-hosted by Financial News and Six Exchanges. Uh, my name is Francesco Guerrera. I am the publisher of Financial News and I'll be your host for uh, uh, this exciting uh, discussion. In about uh, two minutes, we're going to go um, and discuss uh, the and take you behind the scenes of one of the most important parts of the trading infrastructure, the post-trade industry, and look at the future uh, with a star-studded panelist, uh, as, uh, with star-studded set of uh, panelists, which I'm going to introduce in a second. Just a reminder that this is the third installment or a four-part series that Financial News is co-hosting uh, with uh, uh, six exchanges. Uh, the, parts, the series is called The Future of Exchanges and explores the changing roles of trading venues amid shifts in technology, investor behavior, and the regulatory landscape. So we, this is the third one. We'll have another one soon. All of these are available for you to watch uh, on demand. Uh, and so without further ado, let me introduce you to the panel. We'll discuss uh, the future of post-trade uh, in the next hour or so. Uh, I'll start uh, with uh, uh, Richard Gordon, who's Global Head of Security Services Operations and Global Market Infrastructures at JP Morgan Chase. He, joined us, uh, he will join us on the phone because of some technical uh, problems, but uh, it'd be absolutely fine. Hani Kablawi, Chairman of International at BNY Mellon, is also on the phone for us. And of course, uh, last but not least, uh, on the screen with me, Thomas Zeib, Head of Securities and Exchanges at SIX. Um, welcome, uh, gentlemen. Um, let me uh, start uh, with a uh, setting the scene. I would like you, from your different perspectives uh, within the post-trade environment, to set the scene for us uh, and uh, tell us how you see the post-trade industry, uh, its challenges, its opportunities, and also how technology can help it improve in the next uh, few years. I would like to uh, start with you, Thomas, please. Good morning, Francesco, and thank you. Uh... Hi, Thomas uh, uh, left us uh, <laughs> uh, uh, gremlin in our systems. Uh, so uh, why don't I go straight to Hani? Uh, Hani, give us your perspective uh, as, a, as, a, as a user and an intermediary in this world uh, of uh, um, how you see uh, the future of uh, post-trade. Um, uh, uh, thanks very much for including us, uh, Francesco. So um, first thing to say, perhaps, is that uh, technology and digitization has been a journey that the entire industry has been on um, and that there is no one big reveal in all of this. I think that um, as technology becomes more enabling, it will be more used for good purpose, for value uh, in the industry. So um, I think the industry, the entire industry has been tested quite significantly over the past eight or so months, and it passed the test. Um, and I think the past six to eight months have also been, a, in addition to stressing and testing the system, it has also accelerated the journey towards further digitization. And when I say accelerated, uh, we, we've had um, upwards of 60 clients over the past six months move away from what used to be at least in part manual processes to fully digital from instruction capture all the way back towards um, reporting and, and the consumption of data back from us. So effectively enabling the automated work flows and straight through processing. These are 60 clients and about 500,000 transactions that would have been manual, that became automated because the environment allowed us to push for and enable that digital journey. Digitization is really important for a number of reasons. Um, it, number one, it, it, um, it reduces risk. It improves client experience. Um, it, uh, it reduces cost, and some of those cost saves go back to the beneficial owner or end investor. And very importantly, it enables data utilization, data flows, so that the entire industry that used to be in the back, we all referred to it in the past as back office or middle office, um, pushes into the front and effectively becomes a provider of data and analytics that uh, can help clients not just meet their uh, operational workflow and oversight needs, but also 
help them make better informed decisions. Francesco, let me stop there. I'm happy to deep dive into any of these areas. That's great. Thank you, honey. Uh, let me ask you a quick follow-up question. So the 60 clients, um, is that... That is a small percentage of your client base, I take it, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a sample, yeah, if you yeah. like. Yeah, so the context, yeah. So the context here is that uh, to the extent we have, let's say, within asset servicing, 2,000, 2,500 clients, um, many of them are already uh, fully digitally enabled, but there is a tail of clients that continues to uh, instruct part of their flows manually and continues to consume data via PDF. And it is that tail that we're trying to push quite um, aggressively in partnership with them towards more digital flows. And we've been helped in pushing that, um, uh, I'm going to call it stubborn tail, right, towards the right end outcomes over the past six months because of the uh, uh, environment in which we are all operating. Understood, thank you for that. Uh, I see Thomas back on, back with us. So uh, Thomas, um, let me ask you the question again, how do you see the future of post-trade from your perspective? Yeah, sorry, I do apologize for that. Um, look, from an infrastructure perspective, as you know, we've got the, um, the, the, the exchange, the CCP and the CSD in this silo. And what we're seeing is a number of new competitors coming in with with all kinds of promises about how they're going to revolutionize the business, disintermediate banks and everything else. Um, and frankly, very little of it stands up to any scrutiny. What we what we do see, though, is that now from a from a purely a, a, an infrastructure perspective, there are ways that we can use some of the new technology to substantially decrease the cost of core processing in the post-trade environment um, and generate the kind of data and the additional capabilities that um, someone like Hani and his organization would use or, or um, uh, Richard and his organization. So I think we look at it from a slightly different perspective. We're not in that business, even though we have a data business as well, but we're not going after the buy side behind our main clients. We're, we're here and see it very much as our role to make that post-trade piece as efficient, both from a capital usage as well as from a, a processing operational point of view as possible. And I think some of the new technologies can help us there, but they need a degree of robustness that currently is a challenge. That's interesting. So we'll delve into that later in the panel. Uh, let me bring in Richard now um, and see, since we heard from an infrastructure provider and a giant custodian, let's hear from a bank. Uh, Richard, what's your perspective on this and what do you want to see from the post-trade industry in the future? Oh, great. Thanks, Francesco, and, and delighted to, to join the panel today. So I guess uh, having spent the last 25 years in operations, I, I just my comments will be rather unapologetically grounded in, in today's reality. And, and I think my, my practical vision for post-trade is to achieve the highest possible speed of finality at the minimum cost at the maximum transparency very simple and i think look if you look at an example of you order a book on amazon you go and you, you place your order or your, your trade is accepted and that's it there is no post-trade process no one calls you up and asks you did you want the hardback or the softback no one rings you up to confirm your sort code it just works. And, and I do like their definition of the best client service is no client service because you just don't need it. So I think our aim, frankly, is to have the minimum amount of post-trade and no less. And for me, I, I think, and I agree with some of the comments from, from Hani, I see this as a journey. I see probably three stages, uh, which are automation, uh, digitization, and then finally, machine learning enablement. The three phases are continuous, they feed each other and, and they move in parallel. Just one or two statements on, e on each of those. So for automation, like all of us on the broker dealer side have got many hundreds of staff in post-trade and it's the same on the buy side. And so some, some questions I would 
I would float would be, you know, do we all know what our staff are doing in post-trade? Can we visualise the invisible work that goes on? It's not as if we're working in you know, a Tesla Model 3 factory and we can see the output. The work we're doing is digital. And so you've got to be able to understand what people are doing. Then the question is, have you aligned your technology priorities to maximise automation? And the other question I ask is then, are you sufficiently investing in reference data? Because as you increase levels of automation, you take humans out of the process, your exposure to what I call reference data risk increases because you just don't have those human shock absorbers in the process anymore. A couple of statements on digitization, just very, very briefly. And again, I'm picking up, I, I fully agree with what, what Hani was saying in terms of collaborating with clients to change behavior. And I think that is the key to look end to end through the post-trade process, everything from client queries to account opening requests, to corporate action instructions, to the need for wet ink signatures. Let's see if we can move away from those. Because that's key, once you digitize a full process, then you can unlock more opportunities for automation and you get a positive feedback loop. Final couple of statements on machine learning enablement. I think it's early days for operations. We're a highly controlled, control-focused community, and it's important in this space that we bring our regulatory colleagues and stakeholders on this journey with us. But I do feel there are promising opportunities, and I do feel that machine learning can be used to create intelligent self-healing processes. And, and let me just maybe a couple of comments on that, uh, Francesca, if I could just have one more minute. Um, so let me explain what I mean. So when you're, if you're designing a tunnel to go under the sea, you've got a couple of design choices. You can either spend a huge amount of time trying to design a tunnel that's 100% waterproof and 100% watertight, or you can go with a philosophy that says, do you know what, we're going to have some leaks, and therefore I'm just going to design in some water pumps. And so we can use machine learning to help us with the exceptions that are inevitable in post-trade. And there's a couple of stages you go through. You can use it for solving exceptions, routing queries. You can use it to prevent exceptions. And I think this is what Hani was potentially referring to earlier. And we're starting to use our algorithms to proactively predict when a trade is going to fail based on prior experience. And this is when your post-trade team can then get on the front foot be proactive, get out in front of clients and go, do you know what, based on your experience, it's likely this trade's going to fail in two days' time, therefore let's work together and, and take some preventative actions. And then finally, final comment, um, on, this is a, a journey about people as well. So behind all of this, we've got to be upskilling our staff. So we need to ask ourselves, what are the new skills our staff will need as the sort of volume and velocity of, of data exponentially increases as we go forward. So those are just some of my thoughts. Thanks. Great. And, and I like, Francesco, I like just building, building go, go if I can, yeah. on, 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 what just, on what Richard was just saying, um, there was a study by McKinsey in 2019 that suggested that only 25% of financial institutions have applied machine learning and AI into production. So that just speaks to the journey ahead, right? It's a, it's a, it's, it's, um, you know, be, beyond uh, tech companies like the Googles, Amazons, et cetera, um, there's a whole lot of work still to be done in financial services broadly. And I do think that in our organizations, the three represented here, we're, we're probably ahead of the rest of the financial services industry, but there's a lot of catching up to do to make sure that we are delivering on the promise of, you know, resiliency, efficiency, cost containment or reduction, um, uh, automation for uh, better client experience, and so on and so forth. I, I completely subscribe to the, to the Amazon or Apple experience and that we need to bring that experience to our clients, um, uh, the institutional investors. Uh, that, that's, that's great. I want to I ask Thomas to come in on this. Um, uh, before I do that, just, just a quick reminder that the audience can ask questions. Uh, you just have to type them, and I'll put them to the uh, panelists. I'll see your questions. I've seen a couple already, which I will put to the panelists in a second. 
And then one question I received, which is uh, uh, whether this will be available on demand afterwards. And yes, the answer is yes. It will be available for months afterwards on the Financial News website. So you can ask uh, colleagues and friends to, to watch it. You can watch it again. Now, uh, Thomas, uh, Richard and Hani spoke about a journey, uh, and they've defined the journey. What is at the end of that journey? So what is the ultimate goal? I mean, is it cost cutting, uh, more efficiency, better pricing? What are we trying to achieve at the, at the end, or what are you trying to achieve? I think it's 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 all of the above and and a little more in the sense that we need, I think, as an industry to be a good deal more agile in terms of being able to cost effectively launch new products and and look at different ways to service the end customers. So even though I'm not going to that end customer directly, out of the infrastructure role, there it, it comes back to what both Richard and, and Hani have said. You have to look at it end to end, and you have to look at the the Apple experience, if you will, right down to the end client. And what does that mean? And how do we how do we both reduce costs but increase our agility to be able to bring new products to the market quickly, inexpensively? with the ability to cut them off again if they're not successful. That today is a relatively onerous process. And you know, we're not going to obviously get rid of the various compliance steps you have to go through. That's clear. You know, it 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 has to have a degree of integrity, but I think there are a lot of opportunities to not just look at things like onboarding as Richard has said and 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 the contractual pieces and so on, but go much beyond that in terms of how do we actually deliver capital markets products to end clients. And I think we all have a role to play in that and can collaborate with each other to get there because the traditional roles of, of just managing the interface in a vendor type of relationship is probably not going to cut it going forward. And the, um, just a quick follow-up on that, what is the, what, if compliance is a given, right, uh, what, what is keeping the industry from being a bit more efficient, faster uh, to bring products to market? Today, there's a whole, there's a whole process we go through in terms of um, how we evaluate prospectuses, how we uh, set up our systems to be able to handle new product because it usually requires coding changes. There's a, a lack of, of agility in being able to go out there and just work through new products the way some of the fintechs have shown us can be done. Now, do they have the kind of resilience that, that Hani and Richard and their clients need and we demand out of an infrastructure? Clearly not, not at this stage. But they are showing us the way there, there is a way to do this more effectively if you look at the whole process. If you're just taking new elements of technology and trying to automate an old process with new technology and you take a slice in the middle of the process somewhere, the chances are you may have a very limited and short-term business case for that. More likely you won't have one you've really got to look at the whole process and say, how can we do this better? Because the way we've been doing it for the last 300 years and optimizing along the way is probably not going to be the way it's going to work over the next 20, 30 years. Indeed. Honey, I want to bring you, uh, it's interesting that all three of you have mentioned Apple and Amazon. Um, the obvious difference, even a journalist like me can understand between Apple and Amazon, the post-trade industries, margins. Apple and Amazon have huge margins, so they can afford to have this excellent customer service or no customer service that's so excellent. How does the post-trade industry do that, given they, by definition, challenge on margins, honey? I think, uh, I think um, the answer is in some of the comments that all three of your panelists have been making. So um, I think that the margin story is a is a story that is um, uh, uh, of our own making, right? So by deploying the now available new technology, one can create um, uh, through scale and automation a whole lot of capacity to be inventive, innovative, 
create new capabilities and products to Tom's point and create enough capacity to pass um, some of the cost saves of the deployment of new technology and digitization back to clients. I really believe that. Um, and, and, and some in the industry have been doing it now for the better part of the past decade. Um, it requires scale in this business. There's no question about it. Um, and, and two of your panelists have, um, uh, in, in the global custody space, uh, have probably something like 40%, maybe even 50% of market share. Um, so, so they can create that scale that then drives the ability to reinvest back in this business significantly enough to create those margins and the discretionary spend uh, to think about um, new product capability. Now, I want to just talk a little bit about product capability in the context of creating the future. So I, when I, whenever I talk to clients, there's uh, in, in our industry, like, there's two things that they want us to do for them. One is um, cut the noise, deliver a seamless, noiseless, um, painless experience. Uh, and many clients will always tell us, uh, you know, no news is good news when it comes to, you know, the security services industry. But then the other element here, and, and we're starting to get our clients used to this more and more, is, is, the, is helping them with decision-making. So the decision-making framework. I touched on this a little bit earlier by saying, well, you know, we're moving from back to middle to front. Um, by digitizing, we're enabling data flows. By enabling data flows, we're enabling, we're enabling analytics and information that is actionable. So now, while in the past, we might have been important and still are to the COO of a client organization, be that an asset owner or a uh, institutional, you know, an, an investment manager, um, increasingly, we're providing information and insights to the head of marketing and distribution to position their marketing spend a lot more effectively to the chief risk officer to make better informed risk decisions and exposure-based decisions, to the treasurer to make better informed liquidity decisions, and to the investment manager to position their portfolio more effectively. And, and that's only enabled by digitization. So you digitize, you're able to capture flows much more real uh, time or near real time at a granular enough level that is actionable and insight um, enabling so that m most people within a client organization, so it's no longer, think of, a, think of a, 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 um, an executive committee table where a COO is setting, sitting at, and it used to be just the COO who knows this industry well, and now all of a sudden we're reaching the CRO, the CIO, the CFO, and so on and so forth. And, and I think that's, that, you know, helping using the digital journey to enable decision making and insight driving insights is going to be a very important part of what happens next in this industry fascinating and, richard go ahead, please, yeah. to, maybe just to uh, just to extend that point uh, um, from an operations perspective so the value add that we're aiming to give back to clients and we do actively is giving them a view as to where they sit relative to their other peers on our platform with regards to efficiency. So let me just explain that a bit. So what we're able to do is to, to benchmark a client. So I can have a conversation with a client. I can say, right, of, of, the, of the trades you send us each day, your straight through ratio is X, and here's where you sit relative to your peers. So we can start have a very informed conversation as to the areas wh where a particular client is more efficient running through our platform versus where they are less efficient relative to their peers in the areas of trade capture, of settlement, of asset servicing, reporting. And so where it enables you to have a conversation as to potentially where a client's an outlier, and then we can collaborate to figure out, well, hang on, why, why would a particular client be less efficient than its peers, and how can we work together to solve that? So that's a sort of proactive value-add conversation that, that we like to have on the operations side. 
And is that Richard? Uh, so is that what is that? Just value added to the client, or do you charge them for it? Is it a retention uh, poly, um, trick for the client, or how, why would so you do I that? Think in, and again, if you if you take an end to end view, if we can all take costs out of the end to end process, so you get three or four effects. One, you get a more consistent client service or more consistent client journey. Um, you reduce risk in the whole process, and then everybody gets a chance to take out costs. Then potentially you can open up a gain-sharing type conversation with a client. So, for example, if a client, and, and Hani talked about the, the sort of stubborn tail of, of some of our less sophisticated clients who are potentially still sending um, uh, analog type messages, fax, et cetera. If you can have a conversation with a client and explain to them or help them move on to a more digital format, everybody's costs go down. And so everybody can start to have a conversation about how do we how do we gain share. Mm, interesting. I can I ask you? Uh, maybe, I yeah, Thomas. Yeah, that, Francesco. Uh, this is really where where the collaboration comes into play, and we move away from the traditional models of service provider and 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 a buyer of services because the reality is um, at. at at the kinds of prices that exist in the post-trade world, the, the additional cost benefits can only be done by looking at it collaboratively from the client side all the way through to the NCSD. You know, I can, I can charge a manual intervention fee for stuff that falls off the conveyor belt and comes in a wrong format. But the only reason we do that is to have exactly the kind of dialogue that Richard was, was talking about. Because if the instructions come through more effectively in the client shop and behind the back office of, in the client shop from their middle or front office, then we start to see benefits through the whole chain. And that mutualization is an important next step to getting greater efficiencies across the, the whole value chain. I want to bring in the audience now. There's a question, in fact, for you, Thomas, that um, the others might be interested in answering as well, which is, um, he's asking if the whole process is changing to the point that the old distinction between market and post-market infrastructure should fade. So uh, are we moving in the direction of more integrated marketplaces? So not back and front, one whole. Thomas. Is dropped off. Let me, let me ask Hani and Richard to see if they feel that this is going too far, or we are in the in the that's the direction we are traveling in. Um, I, I got to tell you, I do I I do want Tom back on this one because um, there is a very interesting um, uh, trend taking place, a tug, if you will, between those who are looking to establish much more vertically integrated. Um, models from a market infrastructure perspective and those who are doubling down on um, the uh, specialization and choice open architecture or infrastructure effectively and choice effect and 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 I'd be interested in hearing Tom on this I would um, uh, I double down on on the concept um, uh, Francesco that we all should be, enabling the sorts of things that we've been talking about from the perspective of the end investor. At the end of the day, to me, this is about making sure that um, an end investor is able to retire when they want to retire. And if we start with that end and bring it back through the value chain, the right things tend to happen. So if purpose drives everything that a um, uh, 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 that that everybody through the you know the the, the chain of of service provision, um, it, it becomes much easier to align our systems, our people, our technology, our um, our strategies in achievement of that of that end purpose. Um, I. Uh, I'm a buyer of uh, philosophically of open architecture. I believe that no single party will ever have the monopoly on good ideas and good execution 
And I think that if um, we sacrifice choice in favor of vertical integration, you might get short-term benefits, but there's no question you will lose choice and price and, and therefore value in the long term. Thomas, question was whether we're moving into an integrated marketplace. The old distinction between market uh, or trade and post-trade is no longer valid. I think yes in the long term, but it, it really is a long term. There's a long, long journey to build that bridge between the traditional elements of the market and and what we can do today given technology. And I think it does come back to what Hani said. If we if we work back through that chain and we're delivering value it doesn't matter where we're mutualizing the processing. And it's one of the one of the approaches we've taken with the digital exchange, recognizing that it's at this stage, new products that are coming on that are being tokenized, but they are trading and settling immediately. There's a step in the middle where we can net, but without creating a huge capital requirement for, for collateralization, and it settles immediately it becomes completely transparent in terms of when the trade is done, you've got that in your, in your books. Now, there are risks attached to it in the sense of we need to make sure that we don't sacrifice a relatively small operational risk for a very big credit risk, right? We're working through various ways of doing that. There are ways to make the not the straight settlement. The settlement is straightforward and relatively inexpensive. The asset servicing behind that, using smart contracts, we can make that much, much, much more efficient and less labor intensive. And that's where a lot of our labor is at the moment. So if you take all of that together, at some point in the future, and let's be clear, I mean, banks as well as, as other intermediaries are at this stage not in a position nor are most exchange groups to be able to do this at this time. It, it, the, you know, there's a whole series of end of life investment that needs to be done as we move forward into a different environment. And there's a lot of things we can do in the meantime to become more efficient incrementally. But I do think that over the long term, yes, we will get to a point where it doesn't matter. You don't need to worry about, I've done the trade and now I've got to wait for the settlement and we've got all this stuff going on in between. Do you agree, Richard, or you see different? Yeah, I, I would definitely subscribe to a open architecture-based philosophy. I think in the world of um, technology microservices where switching costs are going to continue to tend towards zero, uh, I think it is important that the industry keeps uh, an open architecture mindset because that will ensure we have the most efficient allocation of resources. And I, and I do think that I, I hear Thomas' sort of long, long-term view that the front and back may well merge together. But I think, in my own opinion, there are necessary intellectual firewalls that are useful to keep between the various aspects of our front-to-back process. You know, at the front, you've got market risk management, you've got derivatives valuations, you've got credit risk, liquidity risk management. And then back to, towards the back end of the process, we've got the more operational risk, settlement risk, legal risks. And then at the back end, you've got things like controls, regulatory reporting, et cetera. So I, I just, you know, I, I'm not quite there yet in seeing why we would want to, um, in any medium time frame, start to sort of think of all of those things together. I think it's just going to be too complicated. Interesting. Um, there's another couple of questions of the audience we will get to in a second. But I wanted to ask a general question about this space. And I'm... I want to bring in the, uh, you guys would have read it, the audience were already, the Bank of England, the high-level panel on post-trade, which I think was published in June 2020. Um, I guess I picked out the most damning quote, but I'll read it to you and then you can react to it. So they said, the, the resulting patchwork, while functional, is complex, costly and inefficient, which impacts operational resilience. So my question is, is this space, the post-trade space, a competitive space or a collaborative space? In other words, should, should people cooperate to get to a better result, or is the usual financial services um, ultra-competitive space? Thomas. I, I think 
history has shown it's a competitive space. Um, I think it, it, you know there's there's various approaches that have been tried to create transaction banks. The reality is everybody believes in standards as long as it's their own standard that's being applied, and and I'm I'm not sure that 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 patchwork as the Bank of England described it is such a bad thing. It allows for different models to be developed and incremental efficiencies to be gained and. There's nothing wrong with that. It's almost like saying co competition is a bad thing. Why? Why would it be? Um, I don't see that part. We will ask for the final, the the, the rest of that question. But okay. I want to bring in Richard on this because I think Richard, you may have a different view on this. Um, I um, again, as a sort of day-to-day -day practitioner, I. I do see the necessary benefits of collaboration. Um, and I think I'll come back to one of my statements earlier around reference data and, and lining up um, data standards, perilously difficult, right. and you can only move at the, uh, the pace of the slowest uh, stakeholder. But I do think collaboration is critical in this post-trade space if we're all going to benefit. Um, and that requires some kind of brave moves on, on some of the largest players in the industry, and, and we're certainly active in that, uh, working with fintechs, and, and they're often very, very helpful at creating a sort of a, a, a neutral uh, place for people to collaborate. Um, but I, I'm definitely a subscriber to that model, because I think the whole industry benefits then um, at a speed that you, you can't achieve by any individual player. Thomas, you dropped off when you were saying that the patchwork is not such a bad thing, um, because yeah, it, it engenders yeah. competition, so yeah. I think in an ideal world, the collaboration is great. The reality is every organization has different budget priorities, different timings, or at a different stage in their in their development of, of their IT. Um, I think there are some things that we can collaborate on that are not um, differentiating factors for for different organizations, and those should be created as utilities to a much greater extent than it is today. No, no doubt about it. Um, but beyond that, I think it's, it's, it's a bit of a pipe dream to believe that we can get numerous organizations to subscribe to the same kind of uh, consortium investment because they're just coming at it from different angles. And, and to I you agree? Pipe dream? Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, I agree with, I agree with the fact. I think it is a fact that there are certain elements of this industry that are better utilitized, um, partly because you can achieve um, uh, cost containment and uh, standardization of of workflows, and importantly where there isn't um, value in differentiation. So exchanges uh, and CCPs are examples, um, but it goes well beyond that. And I, I, I do agree that there is a, there's a, a, an, an opportunity still to utilize certain parts of the value chain here that we all um, are, uh, are performing uh, in a way that might be a little bit different. But what I, what I want to address is back to your core question about the Bank of England's statements, right? I think that what they're concerned about is systemic risk um, as it could manifest itself by uneven investment in systems and platforms and mainframes um, and cyber security and defenses, uh, resulting in potential patchwork of um, readiness, resiliency, right? Uh, so that's one part of it is the resiliency element. Um, and the other is the, 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 uh, the ability to offboard and onboard, the ability for a, an investor to, to fold 
on one provider and go to another quickly, easily, and without incurring significant expense and risk. And I think those are the right two things to worry about. And they are two things that we as an industry need to continue to drive. And I think some of the things that we've been discussing, Richard mentioned microservices earlier, will help us all deliver a um, collectively more rather than individually, right? Because we're individually, we're all investing in more resiliency, you know, um, retirement of end of life platforms, um, investment in microservices, providing clients with, cho with choice, open architecture and, and, and solutions from third party providers and so on and so forth. But there's a lot of that that can be, uh, number one, you know, the, the core infrastructure underlying it, the, the stuff can be utilitized, and we can work closer together, I think, around the resiliency and replacement or transition, onboarding, offboarding storyboards. Do you agree, Thomas? That could be utilitized, and then I'll bring Richard in as well, so if you see if you have unanimity on this. Yes, absolutely. No, no question about it. There are significant parts of this industry that are still very, very duplicative um, and, and really don't add value uh, by, by touching the same piece of information two, three, four, five times. That makes absolutely no sense. So yeah, no, no question about it. And, and yet infrastructure is a core part of that. You know, even though I'm an infrastructure provider, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, that is that is our world. That's what we're trying to be more efficient on. Richard? And a couple of thoughts on this. I, I think the, the Bank of England rightly emphasized a couple of macro themes. One, incompatible systems. And they also had a low investment in fintech relative to other um, sections of our front-to-back process. Um, and, you know, and some example, one, one of the areas they, they pulled out was handling trade errors. So I just point to a very, very specific collaboration that's going on at the moment. So we're partnering with a fintech, as are a number of other banks and, and buy side firms, a fintech called Access Fintech. Now, this is a great example of collaboration. So the main use case we're looking at are failed trades. So what happens today when we have a failed trade on the, on the, uh, the bank side? So we, our post-trade staff will call the buy-side client to, to figure out what's gone wrong. The, meanwhile, the buy-side client will be calling their broker to figure out what's going wrong. Meanwhile, their broker will be calling their custodian or sub-custodian to find out what's going wrong. And we're also chasing each other around with phone calls, emails, spreadsheets, etc. So one of the use cases in Access FinTech is we say, let's all, let's all share our exceptions. Let's have a very simple data model. We've lined up on about eight or 10 data fields, that's all you need. And then we can have one clearinghouse where all the exceptions are there. So we don't need to chase each other around like passing a hot potato. We can, actually, we can actually match up the exceptions and we can start to use some technology, eventually machine learning technology, that will determine who's got the next move. And therefore that will enable us all to resolve the exceptions faster. Uh, and again, create one of those like self-healing communities. So that, that, that I'm quite excited about. So in, this, in your example, Richard, who runs that clearing house? Uh, who owns it? Uh, so uh, in this specific example, this is a fintech. Uh, there, are, there are a number of investors, uh, a number of the large broker dealers, and, um, and, and we're hoping to extend the number of investors into the buy side as well. So, it's, so it is, uh, it, it is co-invested uh, by the industry. Okay. But, but it is a fintech. Uh, and, you, uh, and, your view, and your view, you will see a lot of these, or just one that creates that clearing house that you talked about? Look, the... There's no doubt a number of these uh, will emerge. I think what's very exciting in this initiative is creating liquidity. So if you've got the right number of players and you've got critical mass, it could become very, very successful. Um, so I'm asking because if you had a lot of those, then you replicate the fragmentation that you see here now in, in that space or, or not. So you, you really need to see two or three big ones kind of thing too. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm sure that will be healthy for the for the industry to, to, to create acceleration. But, but. Got it. Um, 
I have a very specific question from the audience, which I'll put to you, um, and and then we'll. I have a, several other broader questions that I want to put to you guys. But um, someone from the audience is asking, how do you see the sell side post trade batch processing keeping up with the move by CCP to a real time platform for risk margin and collateral? Maybe Thomas can start with that. Um, well, it's an interesting question because our post trade is running in real time now and is is seamlessly linked into the ccp so um it's it's uh, how do i see it I, I don't see it as particularly relevant certainly out of our experience we're running in a real-time environment uh, now if if the question is related to the t plus two settlement cycle um uh, you know i think the limitation to the T plus two settlement cycle tends to be um, the participants and the brokers that need to do the matching at the front end, right? And this is this is where we would love to bring that down further. I think on the digital side, we've achieved that. Um, we would be ready to move to that immediately. I mean, I can flip a switch and go to T plus instant. But again, we create a significant credit risk if we do that. And we, you know, we've looked at that in the past, and it's it's doable. And I would I would suggest that most infrastructures are capable of doing that, but we we need to bring the market with us, and and that at the moment is a challenge, because there's a lot of work that happens between T and and settlement date. Um, how do we best bring that down? Is is really a function of all the things we've talked about before in terms of making that end-to-end -end process more efficient and fewer mistakes in it and some machine learning and, and so on and so forth, automation processes, so that a lot of the stuff that happens between the trade date and the settlement date is happening virtually instantaneously. And then we can bring that all down. That, that to my mind, is the only way we're going to get there. We've tried to reduce before. And, and you know, there's a there's a great deal of resistance out of the market to do that. Just to be clear, so on the digital exchange, you are instant. You're, you're in real time. Is that right? Yes, there's no, that's correct. There's no T plus anything. Correct. That's correct. Annie, how do you feel about this? If the market is behind, I mean, how can you push it towards that? Well, advocacy, I think. I mean, I, I've got very little to add to what Tom uh, just said, but um, but I think. Um, there is a role in all of this um, where where the industry can benefit from uh, from a collective move to uh, to work together on it, right? To advocate, but um, not, nothing really more to add, Francesco. Got it. And Richard, anything from you? I mean, everybody when when you ask about T plus two, everybody says that this two is really important. That there's a lot going on in that two, so you can't. You can't reduce it to zero or instant, as Thomas said. Yeah, I mean, I, I just one comment, just uh, picking up on the the batch processing hypothesis. I think all of us are investing heavily in technology modernization programs, and I think um, all of us are experimenting, exploring ways to move away from any reliance on batch processing. So we're all trying to remove um, any you know slack time in our processes. Um, so I, I think that is just a general trend that we're moving away from. So, and I think that we'll we'll continue to make progress in that. Um, and I, and I think, bring, and I think on that to that point, Francesco, I do think that you know global companies that um, are serving other global companies have had to move away from batch processing because of the follow the sun, right? The fact that you've got a client who's being served upwards of 24 hours a day um, across three you know, or more time zones from a, from a, a delivery perspective. Um, so I think that's, um, you know, that's a, uh, I think of batch processing within our industry as a thing of the past, to Richard's point. Interesting. Um, let's begin everyone's favorite technology, uh, distributed ledger technology, DLT, as you guys call it. Um, what role does it play right now and what role can it play in, in the future? Maybe I'll start with Richard. Um, 
I'll say my, my position today is, is one of a practitioner. Um, so um, at, at this point, we're obviously um, analysing the opportunities very, very carefully. Um, we're in a, um, a mode whereby where we see an opportunity, we're partnering, we're exploring and we're investing. But if I just bring things right back to today in the post-trade processes we're running today, it is not um, an area that we've embedded in our um, production processes today. Um, and I think, look, great um, promise and definitely something that we should as an industry explore. Um, but I think it's a, it'll be a long journey is my own personal view. And why is that, do you think? Why, why long journey? Um, I, I think the um, transition uh, costs will be significant. Um, and again, I, I, I think I'm still waiting to see a, a compelling business case emerge. I think if that had emerged, I think you would see the industry moving a lot faster. So I think there's, there's work to be done on that. Thomas, how do you feel about DLT? Uh, well, we're, we're using DLT in the digital exchange, and I think we have to be a little bit careful to separate what is a digital token with a smart contract attached, so the asset, and what is the process, the technology we're using to settle. Um, we are using a traditional trading platform because centralized trading in low liquidity assets, it makes no sense to fragment that into a distributed ledger. So once that centralized trading platform has done the pre-matching, it then goes into the, into the DLT. And yes, we see the potential, but I'm with Richard in that. <laughs> and we lost him. Uh, honey. DLT, yeah. I read a few things about DLT potentially disintermediating the custodian, so changing the nature of the custodian if he gets uh, widely accepted, right? Is, is that a, well, an opportunity, a threat? Um, it's, it's, it's both, but, but let me go back to the core of this, right? So every, every, um, everything has to solve for something right? to, to, to become uh, widely adopted. I do think that there was a lot of hype around uh, DLT, and I think that um, uh, in in this space, if we're trying to solve for um, driving costs down, we we should be doing that. And if we're trying to solve for uh, mutualization of risk, we should do that. And if we're trying to solve for faster, more instantaneous uh, information provision, we should solve for that. Um, what is DLT looking to solve for? So, look, on the one hand, I think that the reality is it, it isn't this industry that's slowing down adoption of DLT. I think that um, uh, DLT has the ability to solve for some things, lock, stock, and barrel, but we're going to be following our clients um, and, and trying to solve for their issues, right? What, you know, adding value both in the traditional space and through DLT where, where there's an opportunity. I, I don't think that the opportunities in DLT right now are significant, um, uh, but where there are early beginnings, we get involved. So we're involved with clients to solve for, by the way, we're, we're in the uh, finality, the utility settlement coin, trying to help establish a, um, a, 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 a digital fiat currency. Um, we're helping some clients think through what does a um, tokenization of real assets look like and how does a, token, a tokenized asset get uh, issued, cleared, settled um, across a number of custodians uh, so there, there's a there's a lot of use cases, but they're 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 very early stage, and um, and I'm I'm with Richard on the tail on this thing, um, even on the size of this thing. So to what extent does it actually um, replace or displace um, parts of, or to your point, the entire value chain, yet to be seen. 
But what I will tell you is before it does that, this industry inve would invest in it to be a part of the solution, um, not um, uh, not an inhibitor or a um, or, 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 or slowing it down in any way. Thomas, back to you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I keep getting getting tossed out of the line here. Um, I, I would agree with what, what Hani just said. We are experiencing it ourselves. I mean, we, we experimented with DLT several years ago and putting it in the middle of other traditional processes to cover just one part of the activity doesn't give you a business case. Um, again, what we're doing around the holistic view in the digital exchange is, is addressing those various issues and really saying, how can we mutualize this process? But by definition, it needs the participants to be on the note, right? It, it needs that, and that requires investment by the market. So what we're rolling out now in the token space is not yet ready to be applied to all of the traditional securities we have in the various central depositories around the world. It's, it's just not ready for that yet. The market isn't ready, regulation isn't ready, and frankly, the technology isn't ready yet because the capacity isn't there yet to replicate what we do in the traditional world today. But we see enough promising elements of being able to mutualize reduction of risk, mutualize a lot of the stuff that a transaction bank model has tried to address over the years that, that you could do all of that and reduce costs very substantially in terms of the asset servicing elements um, around an asset once it's once it's tokenized, has a smart contract, and is working through the chain. So yes, a lot of potential, but there are still some very significant hurdles we need to overcome. And we're starting the process, but we know that it's it's a 10-year play. Wow. Um so, so we talked a lot about the future, right? And rightly so, given that that was a topic. I just want to spend the last two or three minutes on the situation now. Uh, Richard, I think, and Hani mentioned the stubborn tail, the people, they're analog, right? the faxes and stuff. Um, first of all, Richard, what percentage would you say of your clients is still like that, the stubborn tail? And, and look, I, I'm not sure it's going to be helpful to, to put a percentage on it. I, I think it's a, I think that more of a, um, a maturity cycle. So when you innovate with new products, you, you generally go through a bedding in period where it you need to work with clients to fully automate things end to end. And you and you often have a tail of, of activities that take longer to fully automate uh, than your more mature um, highly liquid products. So that's it's always going to be there and it's always going to require you know, hard work of collaboration, automation, using digital tools, using influencing techniques, lining up the technology investment cycles of our clients with our own technology investment cycles, um, and then collaborating on what gives us the the um, the, the biggest impact um, to, to mutually benefit. So I, I think that's probably how I would think about it. Um, you know, we're we're starting to spend more and more time providing advice to our clients. Um, you know, you know, we, we run a, a very large scale platform as as does Hanny's organization. So we've got lots of experience in understanding what good looks like. Um, and so we're we're finding that those skills, those automation skills, those continuous improvement skills are ones that our clients are very interested in. Um, and using some tools, you know, such as Alteryx, et cetera, those sort of tools are actually extremely helpful. To create acceleration and solve some um, some uh, efficiency challenges, whilst we're waiting for the core platforms to catch up. So that's probably how I would think about it. And a, and a client and a client organization is often a collection of individuals sitting in very different departments that don't often, um, you know, talk to each other and align on what great looks like. So to Richard's point having a consultative approach, understanding who's sending, for example, the manual instruction, why is it being sent? Oftentimes it's a, you know, it doesn't feel like a manual instruction when they send it, 
but um, because because of the you know because of, there's um, there's a limited understanding of the workflow end to end. So oftentimes it's it's um, it's about finding all the all of the people or the right people within a client's organization and having the conversation around risk reduction, cost elimination, um, uh, data provision, right? Inside driving insights, which are, would be available if if the workflows were automated and digitized, and would not be available if they weren't, so that um, so that so that they can benefit, and through that benefit, they can see a return on the investment. Because oftentimes, it's an actual investment that they need to make in their workflows to get you to the end-to-end that, that we're all looking for. So, you know, s- selling the client on the potential return on investment is part of helping them automate their own workflows. Mm. Very interesting. On that positive hopeful note i think that's all we had time for unfortunately it, the time at least for me flew by i hope it was the same for the audience thank you so much so i want to thank uh, the panelists first of all richard gordon hani kablawi and thomas zeeb i, I want to thank our uh, partners six exchanges and remind you that this is the third in a full part series the financial news is organizing with six exchanges on the future of exchanges so look out for uh, the fourth installment coming out soon I want to thank the audience for being with us uh, and also remind you that this will be available like all the others on demand on the Financial News website for several months. Uh, so if you uh, want to uh, go over again and see it again or ask someone to log in and look at it, uh, please do so and keep uh, obviously abreast of all the financial news uh, in this space and others through Financial News and other Barons Group publications. And finally, I just want to thank you, all of you, for being with us. These are very difficult times. It's nice to feel connected even like this uh, and talking about uh, an interesting topic. So that's really been uh, a great experience, uh, at least for me. And with that, I want to thank you guys, thank the audience, and hopefully see you soon. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you. Thanks.